Always good to speak to you, Chris. We're here at the, uh, the 2014 Elite launch. Uh, exciting day for you guys. It is actually, yeah. Um, I think more than before, more than at any time before, we've worked really hard uh, on, on this range and just tried to squeeze as much as we possibly can in. And it's been, it's incredibly satisfying to look at the bikes we've got here and say, well, that's it, we're done. But we're already on to the next cycle. Which is when we were in the wind tunnel two days ago, um, starting to work on ideas for the next cycle. So it's never ending. But this closes this particular chapter, and it's been it's been brilliant. And we're really happy with what we've done. Does it become more difficult as the as the years pass, and obviously you, you create a great product? Yeah. British cycling always talks about marginal gains. Do those marginal gains continue to get more marginal years go by? Well, oddly enough, I, I, you feel like that. You think, bloody hell, that's it. I can't do any more than that. But I, I spoke um, about two years ago with a guy called Paddy Lowe at um, McLaren. So I used to work with McLaren quite a bit, but I used to help British cycling. And we were standing on a gantry looking at their cars from past years. And I said, how do you keep making improvements, particularly when you've got all this kind of research? And he said, we'll see that one. He said, when that rolled off the line, I thought, that's it, we're done. And then that's the one the year after, it was 2% better. And there's the one the year after, it was 3% better. And so on and so forth. And he said, in the end, I just learned to have faith. And if you, can, if you keep looking with passion, you're fine. And that's pretty much how we're at, where we're at with bikes, really. Um, because you put everything that you've currently got in your imagination into a, into a machine, it's quite scary and you think, that's it. But if you keep looking and you bump into new people and new ideas, there'll be more. And because we give ourselves a two-year development cycle, we've got time to do it as well. One of the things that we spoke about um, probably just over two years ago at the, the previous launch, uh, you were just starting a, uh, I'd say a new but it's a separate distribution process with some of the uh, independent bike shops for yeah. this elite range. Just tell us a bit about how that's developed since then and, and that's how that's going to continue for the future. The, uh, the, the independent shops that deal with the elite range, we've been, we've been really careful. We want people, we want to make sure that each shop's got space around it, we want to make sure they've got a fit service available, and all the backup that goes with the bikes as well. Uh, so it's not just the machine, but everything around it. So we've been really careful to build it slowly, but by the end of the year we'll have about 50 shops, and we don't really want milk more than that. We want, we want to make sure that we can control it and, and make, a, make sure we get a really good service. And I, I'm really happy that we've been able to make sure now we've got a full range of really great stock that they can go and sell. And also one of the other development areas uh, we talked about then uh, was uh, being a British athlete and a British company uh, was that development internationally. Uh, you've also sponsored Pete Jacobs who won uh, in last year. Um, how has that progressed or how, how difficult is that to take a uh, you know, successful brand in Great Britain and, and make that into a, a global brand? And I think what's the direction? I think performance is performance. I mean, I mean Pete in particular, I mean, he's about as challenging as it gets because he is literally on the other side of the planet. Um, but we did things like we, uh, we we instructed Pete on how to take shots of his bike, sort of on a, a long lens with a flat background, so we could take pictures of his, his position precisely as he has it now, put that into our CAD and make sure that we design bikes that are the right size for him. So we, we make the relationship work, and I learned a lot about our Pete because the new time trial bike, you see it's a nice sleek top tube and everything's integrated, and thinking this guy's got to have 300 millilitres of gels or he doesn't complete the event. We've got to keep him somewhere. I don't want him screwing up my bike. So we started to work on ways to, to deal with that as well. So it's been um, it's been very useful for the development of bikes to be involved with athletes like that. And they don't always, like Alistair and Johnny, live in the UK. And um, one thing you did do this year, you went over to Kona, uh, the big bike launch of the, of the TTE of Kona. That was, I think, the first time for you guys. How did that work out? Was that uh, almost a statement of that internationalisation of the sport? Yeah, I think it, we will make sure we're more and more each year we're ramping up the commitment and to go to Kona, I mean that's home of triathlon really isn't it? Uh, it was a great experience for me, I learned an awful lot. We watched Gordon Ramsay, we were having a beer on the patio watching Gordon Ramsay, I said if Gordon Ramsay could do that, I could do that. And it sort of snowballed and I said, if you can get me in on a celeb ticket, I'll do it next year. And they're taking it seriously, <laughs> so uh, my ego is too fragile to withdraw, so I could end up doing it myself next year. So, but it's fascinating a whole new field of bike development for people who aren't constrained by the rules that we are uh, with the UCI. Yeah, just, just, a, just a couple of questions.
questions about myself but away from the bike to make for the triathlon. I talked to our wife on the way here about questions to ask and one thing I that she came up with was from your professional career, if you had to choose the, the one performance or the one moment that you're most proud of, what was it? Probably not what people would expect. People would think our record, you know, the, the, the furthest distance ever, which was, you know, super high technology, or Tour de France prologues, or, or the Olympics. It was probably the final hour record, and it was actually, it was something that we researched a little bit in '92. But people don't know, we did some, some trials with a standard bike and a bunch of bananas crash out, things like that. Um, and then forgot about it. And then just before the end in 2000, my boss Roger Leger said, "You've been responsible for pushing the technology and giving the UCI a headache. Wouldn't it be nice to clean up before you left and finish with the athletes hour and do something that is just about the athlete? And it will be the same now, 30 years ago or 30 years in the future. Uh, so it's probably that actually. I just got away with it, beat the record by 10 meters, 0.2 of a second. Um, but it was a lovely way to finish. So it's probably that. It's a great video that I, yeah, I know it's available on, on the net and uh, you know, or probably now on Catch Up TV and all that sort of stuff. It's, it's a great, great piece there. Um, you these days, you, you mentioned there that maybe, uh, I know you've got some, some dodgy ankles from a, from a crash in the yeah. prologue, but yeah, may, maybe Iron Man might drag you out. But just day to day, what's your, what's your current sort of I do about four ratio? days a week on the bike uh, when I'm home, and that's been a problem the last few weeks building up to this launch. Uh, fundamentally, I do three to four days a week, two hours ago. I mostly cycle across bike actually because I live on a peninsula so I've done the same roads for 30 years and it just refreshes it and stitches together tracks and paths plus there's no historical speed records which is a good thing um, so I do yeah three or four days a week and that's enough do you, do you find um, if you get other cyclists that come past or see you and, and spot who you are do they, do they is their ego get the best of them and they want to race or that's the other upside to using tracks and paths is uh, you don't bump into too many people it's definitely a thing actually, if I go out with other people, everybody wants to race up the next hill, uh, which does get a little bit weary to be honest. And I, to be honest, I deal with it these days by just if you want to have a go, feel free, and I'm going to ride at my own pace. So I just tend not to get involved and just enjoy riding my bike. And um, now, now you've sort of stepped away a bit from that, uh, you're, you're working pretty cycling. Um, do you? When you're, you're watching or following this sport, is it, is it any different now? Are you, are you able to just sort of relax a bit more and, and watch it more as a, as a fan rather than as somebody embedded in it as an employee? That's a good point, yeah. I mean, I, I watch it for different, excuse me, that, that was part of my history, so I'm always watching them. I watch what clothing Tony Martin's using in the time trial, and he's always got something underneath the top there. So that, that kind of level of interest, that strata, I'm watching all the time. Um, it's probably, I think, what you might call a transition period now from being heavily involved to being a spectator. And I'm quite enjoying it, so I'm just moving from one place to another. Um, I'll always be involved in things like the Tour de France and watching it, and I'll be working on it next year. So, yeah, probably best ask me the same question in about another year or two. And uh, last question, I did an interview uh, for us uh, with Richard Mellick and Conan, one of the things yeah. that I spoke about there. Um, so you're doing some work, or going to be involved in sort of the promotion of cycling to, to a, a wider audience, not, a, not in a performance centre in terms of just trying to get people out and fit within a cycling environment. What, what's that involved or what role that involved? I think to me, I mean, I, I, it's one thing, if I've got a soapbox, this is it, and I, I don't care if people want to ride a race. I, the bicycle is just a phenomenal form of transport. It's a solution to so many of the problems we've got. It makes me angry that we're not just moving everything out of the way to let people use this bike as a form of transport. 70% of the journeys in this country less than three miles. Five billion pounds a year spent on obesity-related illnesses. You know, and so on and so forth. It's just infuriating. So that's one thing I'm very passionate about. I've spent a lot of time in this city in the last year trying to push that forward. Now is the time. And I think we've got a window of about two years to try and make the bike one of the fundamental forms of transport in the UK. Do you think something like the, um, yes, the sportive market is obviously boomed and that's, that's got, you know, we call them the, the mammals and middle aged man in life and uh, the relatively recreational cyclists out into the uh, semi capacity environment. But last year, obviously, we had the, the, the Ride London, which was probably dwarfed by anything that seems to have really made an impact. Do you think things like that can, can contribute in a way to, to that, yeah. that goal? The 
sportive event that are, are fantastic phenomenon that's developed because they're not scary. You don't have to be in a club, you don't have to be a regular cyclist, and you can do it from doing it with your mates and stopping at the pubs and cafes to treating it as a race and everything in between. And so they're a fantastic non-scary vehicle to get people from couch to club. You know, they get lets people have a go. And I think that's so important. The things like the Ride London, they do just that, they just let people have a go. So they're a big part of the jigsaw, I think, of, of allowing people to get more comfortable, re-familiarise themselves with the bicycle. And it shows when you've got what, two million cars sold this year, 3.8 million bicycles. Well, hopefully a few of those will be uh, evolvements. Oh, I'm open, so yeah. Always a, always a pleasure to speak to you, Chris. Uh, we'll be covering the uh, bikes in a little bit more detail uh, on uh, articles elsewhere on the site. But good luck with the, the launch, and um, I'm sure probably around about two years from now we'll be looking at the, the 2016 model, and we'll be seeing uh, how many percentage uh, points uh, faster we're going to be going at Kona. So, Fingers crossed. Yeah, good luck with that, and, uh, and uh, yeah, hope the, hope the range goes well. Thank you. Cheers.